So I think that the work can look different for a lot of people. But for me, that was going to therapy. That was spending time in silence. That was spending time by myself, meditating, journaling, and just really being intentional, right, about reflecting over my life and the things that have kind of happened to me. Thomas Edison, Richard Branson, John F. Kennedy, Mozart, Michael Jordan, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of vocations. Why is it that we rarely hear that they have or had ADHD? And you know what we hear even less about? Serena Williams, Emma Watson, Mel Robbins, Whoopi Goldberg, Agatha Christie, Aaron Brockovich, Cher. Yeah, the successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka. I'm a lawyer, not a doctor, a lifelong student, now a coach. I'm also the creator of Your ADHD Brain is A-OK, a system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your strengths, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest gifts. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am your host, Tracy Otsuka. Thank you so much for joining me here for episode number 189 of ADHD for Smartass Women. I hope that you'll subscribe to this podcast and our newsletter over at tracyoutsuka.com. You know my purpose. It's always to show you who you are and then inspire you to be it. Look, in the thousands of ADHD women that I've had the privilege of meeting, I have never met a one, not one that wasn't truly brilliant at something. So for all of these reasons, I am just delighted to introduce you to LaToya Williams. LaToya is a healer, public speaker, and ADHD advocate. She's currently a graduate student studying marriage and family therapy, specializing in trauma-informed systemic therapy at North Central University. She also holds degrees in speech communication and rhetoric from LaGuardia Community College and television and radio production from Brooklyn College. Self-dubbed the professional disruptor of culture, she is a certified personal empowerment coach and the founder of Your Greatest Good. This is what interested me the most, though. After studying Japanese for a number of years, LaToya traveled to Japan to study the teachings of the Tenrikyo religion and became a priestess of the faith. LaToya was diagnosed with ADHD in 2020 after the pandemic forced her to have to start working from home, and she's convinced that this was the greatest thing that could have possibly happened to and for her. LaToya hails from Brooklyn, New York. She loves to travel, karaoke, zip lining, and hanging with friends and family. She is always down for an adventure. And boy, did I just put LaToya through one, didn't I, LaToya? <laughs> we literally 15 minutes trying to figure out what is wrong with the mic. We were able to no. communicate, no problem at all. And then all of a sudden, I could no longer hear her. So I put her through this whole dog and pony show. Drill. It's totally fine. <laughs> and then like realized I said. yet again, it was <laughs> my speaker. Somehow I turned it off. This happens to me all the time. As I was telling LaToya, whenever there's a problem with tech, it is always my fault. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> so how are you? I'm doing so super well. I'm really excited to be here talking with you. Thank you so much for having me. This podcast has been so monumental for me, um, especially after being diagnosed with ADHD. So 
happy to be here. Well, I am so happy to have you. Before we talk about Tenricchio, did I get it right that time? Yeah, all good. <laughs> You're not even going to tell me at this point. Um, <laughs> before we go into all that, you know, I always want to hear about the ADHD story. So can we talk about your diagnoses first? Yeah, absolutely. So I first suspected that I had ADHD in 2017. I was working in digital marketing and I was struggling. I was not having a great time. And I knew that it wasn't for like a lack of intelligence, but something was amiss. But fast forward to 2020. If I can Mm -hmm. stop you. So what was going on in 2017 in your digital marketing job that you were like, ah, something's not right. Yeah. So it's a very... uh, it's the kind of industry where things can shift at a moment's notice. And so there would be times where I was working on something and then I get a ping for, from my manager and they're like, hey, uh, I need you to stop working on this thing uh, and get this other thing to me by 1 p.m. And you probably have like two hours to send them this new deliverable, right? And what I understand now was that, you know, it's a job that required a lot of executive functioning ability. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I was having a really hard time with those kinds of tasks that required me to switch my attention almost immediately. And yeah, I was just really, really struggling in the role. And eventually I ended up transitioning out of the position. So what were the kinds of things that you would have to do that would require the switching? And was the problem, well, let me ask that question first. So it was, for example, my job in particular at the time, I was working in digital partnerships. And so I'd be making like a lot of spreadsheets and just monitoring the data, like pulling data, doing like VLOOKUPs and, you know, working with Excel spreadsheets. And in a moment's notice, that was kind of uh, the main function of my job. In a moment's notice, somebody would kind of tap me and be like, hey, uh, I need you to shut all that down. (laughs) And now we have the clients coming at this time. And so I needed to work on this now. And I was like, oh man, like, and so just switching back and forth between tasks or having the ability to prioritize which tasks I needed to do, like those were the things I really struggled with. And everyone around me seemed to be doing it with relative ease. And again, I knew it wasn't an issue of like lack of intelligence, but it just felt like something was off. And I just couldn't help but wonder, why am I having such a difficult time with this? And I started doing a little bit of research and I, you know, did my Googles and I started looking up (laughs) ADHD, right? (laughs) ADHD and like what those symptoms are. And it was like, a huge aha moment for me because even up until then, I remember being someone that always said, I have a really hard time focusing, like mm-hmm. focusing, don't know her, never met her. Like I, like I always had a really difficult time with that. And so my experience in digital marketing coupled with the experiences of my childhood and, you know, through my adulthood, kind of made me put two and two together. Okay. So talk to me about your childhood. What was Latoya like as a child? Man, I was definitely always someone that kind of just marched to the beat of my own drum. And I still do. And I love that for me. But yeah, she, young Latoya was very quirky, had a lot of different interests and hobbies. And I think sometimes people didn't really know what to do with me (laughs) um, in regards to that. But yeah, I was the kid that did everything. I loved music. I still love music. Music was my very first love. I 
did acting. I used to be in an acting troupe um, <laughs> when I was younger. And yeah, performing was everything. But I also loved school with the exception of math. Um, <laughs> still not a fan. But yeah, yeah I did work in all these spreadsheets. Yeah. <laughs> That really should have just been my first clue, right? Like, okay, maybe this is not the top the job for me. But um, so I'm but assuming yeah. that those <laughs> when you were working those spreadsheets, when you're doing that digital marketing job, yeah. was a lot of it just really boring to you? You know, what was interesting was at the time we were dealing um, by we, I mean my family and I we were dealing with a lot of difficulties, and I had the opportunity to enter a digital marketing training program out of college. And people would tell me like, oh, this is an industry where you make a lot of money. And I -hmm. thought, okay, like, you know, we're struggling. I have the opportunity to do this program. So I did it. And even through the program, I knew that digital marketing was not for me. (laughs) And I think now looking back on it and really thinking about the question, I didn't find it interesting. I wanted to, I really wanted to, because I think overall it is a fun industry to work in, but the work itself was just not interesting for me. Got it. Okay. Did you notice how we switched back from what we were talking about? Because so let's go back. So that's interesting because clearly you weren't interested. So that was probably the underlying problem there, right? Mm hmm. Definitely. Because I don't know about you, but I don't have problems with transitions when I'm working on something I'm really interested in. Do you? That is true. That is a very, very good point. As a matter of fact, right now, I am doing a lot. <laughs> I'm doing a lot. But I am able to balance things well. Mm-hmm. right now because I'm I'm having a great time and I'm enjoying everything that it is that I'm doing right now. And so, yeah, you're absolutely correct in that it just wasn't work that I was passionate about. I was truly, truly, truly <laughs> understimulated in every sense of the word, but I just kind of forced myself to do this because, or do that work because it looked good. Totally. And, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I just had a conversation with my son. He's in an investment banking internship. And, you know, it's kind of all about the money. And I keep telling him, you know, money's great, but you need to make sure that you're using this time to figure out what do you really love? Because you don't want to get stuck in this, be making all this money, and then you're really stuck, right? Because then you've yeah. got all these expenses that you know, have risen to the level of the amount that you make. So I completely relate to what you're saying. Okay, we're going back to Little LaToya. So was Little LaToya a hyperactive chatterbox who was always the center of attention and always on? Or was she more inattentive and kind of daydreaming? I suspect the former, but I don't know. I would definitely say it was a mixture of both. It just depends on the circumstance. <laughs> it really just depended because I, I, I do have uh, my ADHD type is predominantly inattentive. Mm. But in those moments where I was doing the things that I loved, yeah, I was definitely a chatterbox. You know, I loved being the center of attention, right? And so that's why entertaining just became so, was just so natural for me in that way. But so it was a little mixture of both depending on what it is that I was doing. Okay. So what happened? It sounds like school was pretty easy for you, except for math. Right. Correct. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) So high school was easy? High school... In terms of studying, it wasn't too difficult for me. However, I had a hard time in high school because the school that I went to, Michelle uh, remain nameless, <laughs> um, didn't have a lot to offer in terms of, say, extracurricular mm. uh, activities. And there was so much that I wanted to do, but unfortunately, 
I didn't really have the ability to do it due to financial difficulties that I faced at the time. I was raised in a single parent household. Mm -hmm. And then the opportunities wasn't presented to me at school either. And so I remember going to the guidance counselor like at least every few months and saying like, there has to be a way I can transfer out of here. There just there just has to be. And every time they were like, no, I'm like, no, you're like you're kind of stuck here. So high school was difficult for me in that sense. What about socially? Were you good there? I definitely had my group, my clique of friends for sure. Socially it was a little bit tough. I was again, I, I described myself earlier as someone that kind of just marched to the beat of my own drum and That has been true of me for my entire life. And so growing up in, you know, Brooklyn, New York, especially at that age where the, you know, you're kind of pressured, right, to fit in. I I had a hard time with that. And so people would definitely absolutely make fun of me, make fun of the way that I dressed or made fun of how I spoke, you know, because I'm... African American and from Brooklyn. And so people made fun of the way you speak so proper, you speak so, you know. (laughs) So I got a lot of that growing up. Yeah, people called me lame, weird, dork, you know, the the whole, the whole shebang, you know. (laughs) So yeah, like socially was a little bit tough, but luckily I got through it with the few friends that I did have. So then what happened as far as um, college? Did you go directly to college or what happened? Oh, no. College, I didn't go directly to college. I took a year off. I took a gap year. And after I graduated high school, the only thing that I knew was that I wanted to study Japanese because I've always really been interested in the culture and I remember going to Japan Society in third grade and watching <laughs> a lot of like it was it was deep. It was deeply ingrained. Right. <laughs> um, and, and watching a lot of uh, Japanese programming, though, at the time when I was watching it, I didn't know it was actually from Japan. But then eventually I would when computers, were, <laughs> this is I'm going to age myself, but, um, you know, I've been on the computer since the day of like. CompuServe and Prodigy, right? So (laughs) I would start looking up these shows I was watching. And then I realized that those shows originated from Japan. And so I remember hearing the Japanese language for the first time when I was maybe around 10 or so. And I completely fell in love with it. And so when, yeah. And so when I graduated from high school. That is the only thing that I knew that I wanted to do. I didn't know about college. I figured that I'd get there eventually. But again, (laughs) Japanese classes are expensive. So what I did was I emailed, I like kind of cold emailed a bunch of different language schools in New York. And the school that responded, well, actually before that, what I asked was, could I possibly get language classes, discounted language classes in exchange for like volunteer time, right? Mm -hmm. And the school that wrote me back said, you could actually have the classes completely free if you just volunteer around the office a few hours a week. And so that's how I started studying Japanese And that is also ultimately what led me to going to Japan and becoming a follower of the Tenrikyo faith. That is incredible. So literally in third grade, 10 years old, you hear the language and you're just immediately drawn to this is where I want this around me, basically. It's insane because... I went to Japan Society when I was probably like six. What's Japan Society? I don't even, I'm half Japanese. I don't even know what that <laughs> is. Yeah. So it's basically, it's in New York. It is a, basically like a, a institute where they promote Japanese culture. So they have a lot of events there. Uh, they 
offer language classes there as well. Sometimes New York has uh, what's called the New York Asian Film Festival. And so sometimes they'll have like screenings for movies at Japan Society. So yeah, they've, they've been really deeply integrated in New York, especially within the you know, Japanese culture, New York, for a very, very long time. And so I went there when I was six years old, probably, no, it was probably like yeah, anywhere from like six to eight, whenever it was, I first went to um, Japan Society. And I'm 32 now, and it's been such a deeply ingrained part of my life since then. So how did you end up there at six or seven? Was an, was there another family member or friend who took you? No, it was a random school trip. Oh, okay. Did <laughs> you say that? Did you say that? I don't think I understood that. <laughs> that is fascinating. So you're six or seven, you go on this random school trip mm-hmm. and immediately attracted to, I guess, the Japanese culture. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. You're, you're making me feel guilty. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and I love the Japanese culture, but certainly not like this. So, okay. So tell us what unfolded then. You graduated from high school. You're clearly your only mission in life at that point is to go to Japan. I knew from the time I was younger. So so maybe around the time that I first heard the Japanese language and started learning more about Japanese culture and history. And because I, I'm also (laughs) one of my many things, I am also a huge history buff, loved it, thought I was going to go to college to become a historian. Mm. (laughs) Um, But so yeah, I, I, after that, I was like, I'm going to go to Japan. Like I declared this when I was just like, when I was 10, 11, 12. And so I always knew that I would go eventually. Mm -hmm. When I started going to, uh, it's called the school that I studied at, Tenry Cultural Institute Mm -hmm. in New York, that wasn't necessarily the goal. I just just really wanted to learn Japanese. Mm. And I went and I was there. I, I would end up studying there for years. Okay. And at the time, a year after I started studying there, I decided that, okay, maybe it's time for me to like try this college thing out and kind of see how that goes. And I hated it. (laughs) Why? I, it was, it just, I wasn't sure why I was there yet. Mm, Okay. Yeah. And I'm the type of person that like, I need to be very clear on my why. So intention is really important to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I always tell people, like, I'm really intentional, even about the, like, silliest of things. I'm really intentional about it. Well, and that is so important for our ADHD Mm -hmm. brains. So you figured that out even before you knew you had ADHD. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So when I was in college, uh, at this point, I was probably, I'd been studying at Tenry Cultural Institute for maybe three years I and mean, had done two years of college. And it was around that time that I got invited to the church. And Tenry Cultural Institute is affiliated with a church that's a part of the larger Tenry Kyo community. And I went to the church and I loved it. I thought it was so beautiful. And I remember being asked the first time I went, hey, how do you, what do you think about it? Because I know like to people on the outside, it might seem a little weird. And, but like, you know, like I say in my bio, I'm always down for an adventure, right? Like, so I was like, (laughs) dude, like you don't have to explain anything to me. Like this is super cool. Mm -hmm. And maybe a month or two after that, I was asked, like, you seem to really take a like, have taken a liking to the church. Like, what do you think about going to Japan? Oh. And I was like, okay. <laughs> like, I, had, I had no idea what I was really doing or like what, what I was about to embark on. But yeah, they asked. I said yes. And five months after I started attending the church, I was in Japan in a spiritual development course called Shioka. 
studying the Tenrikyo faith in depth. How it well is the Tenrikyo faith? Is it affiliated with Buddhism? Like what? What is it? It's not. Um, so it's not affiliated with Buddhism. It really is its own religious sect, so so to speak. It. I think there are definitely elements of Buddhism that might be present in within Tenrikyo, but it's really its own thing. And in Japan, where I went to go study is Tenri, Tenri City. So that it, it is a religious, it has its own like religious city in, in Japan located in the Nara region. And so what are the basic tenets of Tenrikyo? Is, is there a lot of mindfulness? Like what, what is it? Can you tell us like just a basic little synopsis? Yeah. So what it is essentially, what what really drew me in was, um, so I had grown up going to a going to Christian churches. We kind of bounced around from different churches, but uh, essentially, I grew up within Christianity. And for me, interestingly enough, there was always kind of a disconnect. Mm-hmm. And the reason for that was I am a fan of people, and I am a fan of all people. And so when I would hear things like, you know, God loves all of his children, it always felt like there was kind of an asterisk there. Mm. And so what got me really, I think, when I started to learn more about the Tenrikyo teachings was the idea that we are all brothers and sisters. Like, it doesn't matter if you're from Japan or not. We're all brothers and sisters. And what was beautiful at the time was that I felt that way in the way that I was included uh, at the language school and at the church. You know, again, I am a, I am a black woman from (laughs) Brooklyn, New York. Right. (laughs) And I was just pulled in and it felt so warm. And so when I was told that I believed it. So yeah, it was it was that we're all brothers and sisters and God created us as his children to live a life of joy and to spread joy to others. So there is so, a belief in God. There is a belief in God, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. But it's just much more all inclusive as far as they don't care if you're gay, clearly, you know, what color the sk- your skin is, none of mm-hmm. that matters. Yeah, so that was one of the things that was first things that was said to me, right? Like we don't care about things like that. We don't care if you're gay or mm-hmm. what have you, or we don't care about race, right? We're yeah. all brother and sister, um, regardless of which. And so I just really found that to be beautiful. And yeah, and so that's that's one aspect of it. One of the other teachings is the idea of dust and how as humans, especially living in the world that we live in, we are going to accumulate dust. And it is our responsibility to reflect on the dust that we accumulate and cleanse ourselves from it, right? And so how you cleanse yourself in Tenukyo is through doing the service. And so the service is, I think there's there's different kinds of service. There's kind of a morning service that you do. There's an evening service as well. And you kind of do them uh, during the day and during the evening to, it's almost meditative, I would say. Mm-hmm. You do the service and it involves like certain like hand movements or gestures and a big gesture is this idea that you're kind of sweeping your body Mm. sweeping your body of these dusts and so i'm gonna tell you (laughs) right now what those dusts are but the eight it's called the eight dusts of the mind so it's miserliness covetousness hatred self-love grudge bearing anger greed and arrogance. And so they're kind of there to remind you that like, you know, and again, I think what's really cool about it is the idea that like, no, you're going to, you're going to get dusty, right? You're going, yeah, <laughs> as, a human, 
yeah, like as a human in this world, you're going to get dusty, right? But it's it's your responsibility to reflect on that and learn to sweep yourself of those dust and use your mind appropriately and how you treat people or how you respond to certain things. And so how many times a day are you supposed to do this or should you do it? So usually twice a day. So mm-hmm. you would have the morning service and then evening service. You know, it's kind of that idea of like you're starting your day with yeah. that in mind, right? That, yeah, it's uh, about to get dusty, right? We're going out in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, the um, what, what do they call it? Not an analogy. What, I just love it. Whatever. Yeah. I'm seeing <laughs> my brain while you're saying this. Yeah, you know, and and that was and that was really fun for me too, right? And so, uh, yeah, and you're doing it as well in the evening after coming back from your long day outside, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of reflecting that goes into it. But yeah, there's there's you know a bunch of a bunch of uh, I think different tenants, but I would say probably that those are maybe the main ones that especially like in the beginning that you're taught essentially. So this just seems like the perfect thing for an ADHD brain to be engaging in because it is forcing you to basically pause at least twice a day, right? Yeah. And be really mindful uh, of what's important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that was so dope. Like when I was in in Japan and I was in a spiritual development course, which is three months long, you're really in it, right? And this was 10 years ago, this year actually, that I first went to the spiritual development course. And yeah, it was it was a constant reminder, right? And to just kind of reflect on your use of the mind. Mm. And I, I didn't realize it then, but it was really the start of my own, my spiritual practices, even outside of Tenrikyo, right? Mm-hmm. This idea of mindfulness, right? I had no idea what mindfulness was at the time. But now I, I look at it and I'm like, wow, that was really the start of that for me and the understanding of how important it is to be mindful, right? To to be present, to be aware of like how how we're showing up in this world. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's beautiful. So tell me, what does it mean to be a priestess? So um, <laughs> a high priestess? <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's not, from, I just say priestess. Uh-huh. Really, the technical term is yoboku. And yoboku is, translates to useful timber. And yeah, and in, in Tenrikyo, there's a lot of metaphors for construction. And the idea behind this is that we as followers of this path, are here to build and construct this joyous life world. Uh So Yoboku, which is what I became during my spiritual development course, essentially have certain rights. And that would be to perform the service. And uh, this service is different from the daily service. This is a service that is done monthly. And it's a lot more involved. But in order for you to perform in that service, you have to be a yoboku. Mm. And the other thing is that when you become a yoboku, you are granted by the Shimbashira, who is the spiritual head of Tenrikyo. You're granted a grant called the Sazuke. And the Sazuke is a healing grant. So only Yobokus are allowed to receive this grant and to deliver this kind of prayer to other people. So when you're conducting this service, are you doing it in Japanese or do you, can you do it in any language? So right now it's predominantly done in Japanese. Mm-hmm. There are texts in English and in multiple languages, Spanish, Korean, Chinese. Mm -hmm. 
but the those are usually uh, you would have to like use a book mm -hmm. um, to kind of see how it's being translated. But as of right now, it is um, predominantly done in Japanese. Okay. And so are you fluent in Japanese at this point? I always downplay my ability. <laughs> I do, but I've been to Japan and I've traveled around Japan on my own. I'm definitely conversational. I can handle everyday conversations mm -hmm. and be just fine. I would never say fluent, <laughs> but I handle myself well. <laughs> you can communicate when you're in I, Japan. Yeah, I can definitely communicate. I always, like, again, I downplay it and, like, I'll be like with Japanese friends and they're just like, okay, but you just spent the whole day with us communicating in Japanese. So you're probably better than you think, but yeah, um, yeah so but I, I handle myself well. Well, I just, I love this, the whole idea of this religion. So, and I love that it's Japanese. So I'm curious, what has that led to? Oh man, I think it opened up so much for me. As I mentioned earlier, before going to Japan, I was enrolled in college and I hated it. I had no idea what I was doing there. Mm -hmm. And after I came back from Japan uh, the first time after the spiritual development course, I had so much more clarity around what's possible in this world. Right. Because I never imagined again, like I am a black woman from Brooklyn, New York. Right. I never in a million years imagined that this would be my path and that I would be a part uh, or involved in this, you know, or a follower of this Japanese religion. Never in a million years did I think that. And so when I came back, yeah, so I transferred to a new school where I ended up studying speech communication and rhetoric. And yeah, it really just opened up a new pathway for me. And so again, it just it just really showed me what was possible in the world. And also just the idea that, you know, our paths don't have to be conventional, right? And that speaks to me as someone with ADHD. I definitely think that a lot of what I do now, not only as a studying marriage and family therapist, but also as a life coach is rooted in that idea that sometimes you have to like, you just have to do things that don't make sense to people, right? Um, and so I think that's the thing that really created that shift in my life. Yeah. I, I mean, and especially with an ADHD brain, I, I mean, I always say, you know, we are our only expert. Real, we're our best expert. So it doesn't matter what other people think we should be doing. It matters what we think we should be doing. Exactly. And that was really difficult for me for a long time to accept about myself because I've, like, I've always been very unconventional and when you are unconventional, a lot of the times you are made to feel really badly about that. And right now, especially in my work as a coach, I, I always tell people like a lot of what I do is for the people that were labeled the misfits and mm -hmm. the weirdos and the freaks and the lames, right? Because mm -hmm. society has a way of shutting those people down. And I think the world needs more of those kinds of people. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really just beautiful journey, I think. So what made you decide that, you know what, I need to study trauma-informed therapy? Like, is, mm -hmm. is any of that related to being diagnosed with ADHD or did that happen before? It all kind of coalesced at the same time. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I was, I was, so I was working from home. Uh, this is a few months after the pandemic started. And yeah, I was also having a difficult time adjusting to working from home. The structure of the office, I realized, was really helpful for me. And so I thought back to 2017 
And I was like, you know, I think it's time I get a proper diagnosis. And so I embarked on that journey. I was officially diagnosed in the summer of 2020. And around that time, again, because we are in the midst of this pandemic, I started doing just a lot of reflecting on my own life. And that involved a lot of healing work, a lot of meditation, a lot of shadow work, and just really sat with myself, right? And again, being raised in New York City, right? That is not always an option. (laughs) It's usually not an option to have kind of all of this time to yourself and all this space to yourself. And so I started going to therapy again during that time as well, and really unpacking a lot of the traumas that I had faced in my own life from, you know, dealing with poverty, I realized that I have a lot of issues or traumas surrounding money, right? Mm. And, you know, as you mentioned earlier, right, I, I ended up in digital marketing, chasing money, yeah, when I knew it wasn't right for me. So I I started reflecting on a lot of these different things. And I started doing research about how trauma affects us and how trauma manifests itself in the body. And from there, I just kind of took off. And when I decided to go back to school to become a marriage and family therapist, I knew that that was what I wanted to study because in having conversations with other people, a lot of people I realized aren't fully aware of how trauma impacts them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I know when I started on this whole journey, you know, my thought was, oh, you have ADHD. That's not traumatic. Well, for some people, it's not. You know, if you perform well in school, if you don't have a lot of, you know, family members around you that also have, you know, ADHD and, you know, poor executive functioning skills. And so, you know, you have to, I can't remember where I was starting, but that, you know, you have to worry about things are, is there food on the table? You know, know, Mm -hmm. are they going to do your job? Like, you know, all of that. And then for some of us, it's not trauma, whatever the, you know, instance, you know, the ADHD type instance, but for others, it will be if you're hypersensitive and, you know, more kind of tuned in to other people and what's really going on and, and your own, you know, you're more emotional. Yeah. So I just, I find the whole thing fascinating because initially I was just, I was poo-pooing all of it, but the more you read <laughs> about it, the more you realize that, oh my gosh, if you were, you know, just things like if you were a student and you struggled in certain subjects and, or struggled in school generally, and people were constantly, you know, teachers and parents were telling you, you know, you're stupid, you're lazy. Why are you so unmotivated? Oh my gosh, 12 years ago of that, that's traumatic, you know, yeah. for people. Yeah. And and I think that's the part that a lot of people don't realize is that trauma may not necessarily be this huge, explosive, earth shattering yeah. thing. Right. It could be it can be those, quote unquote, smaller stuff. Right. Those things that you think that you don't think are affecting you in that moment in time. But when you start doing the work, the reflection. Right. And you, you, or for some people it might be like shadow work, right? When you start doing those things and kind of unpacking a lot of the beliefs that you hold about yourself, about other people, about society as a whole, you kind of realize that those beliefs aren't even your own. That those beliefs, like you can't take full ownership of those beliefs. And that's something that was huge for me. Yeah. Right. It's the it's the concept of of social construction, right? This the idea that the our beliefs, our our thoughts, our feelings are directly related to the groups or the culture and society that exists around us. 
a lot of people like to think that, oh, you know, we're these individuals and that we exist in bubbles, but we don't, right? A lot of who we are is relational. And so when you realize that and do a lot of that unpacking, and that was that was it for me too. A lot of the trauma that I carried was I realized generational trauma. Ah. And then I had to do the work to start breaking those those patterns and those cycles. Yeah. So Latoya, what do you mean when you say doing the work? Okay. So I think that the work can look different for a lot of people. But for me, that was going to therapy. That was spending time in silence. That was spending time by myself meditating, journaling, and just really being intentional, right, about reflecting over my life and the things that have kind of happened to me and being able to look at things in my life and say, like, this is something that is not serving me any longer. How do I move past this, right? And that was so huge for me. And again, a large part of that happened for me during the pandemic because, and I feel like for a lot of people, because we were forced (laughs) to sit down. (laughs) We were forced, we had no choice. And I think a lot of people came out of the pandemic. And I say out of loosely because we're still technically in it, but (laughs) but we're just pretending we're not. Right. Definitely pretending, right? (laughs) Jeez. But we came out of it with a lot more clarity around what was working for us versus what was not working for us. That is why you're seeing these trends like the great resignation, right? Yes. Because a lot of people are like, wait a minute, I can get my work done at home and like be there for my family. And I don't have to spend an hour plus in traffic or on the subway. And what, you know, like we started looking at culture as we had known it and started to dissect that. And so this is why I call myself the professional disruptor of culture, because I think that there are certain elements of our culture as we have always known it that is doing more harm than good. Oh, I completely agree with you. All these yeah. silly little boxes, right? Yeah. Oh, and like you know, you said, social constructs. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, and, and again, when you, you know, you kind of go off the beaten path, hmm. people try to hammer you down. People try to make you feel as though you are wrong for for doing certain things a certain way or feeling a certain way or, you know. And so, yeah, I just think that we are in a really interesting place right now and a really interesting time right now where we get to choose differently. Absolutely. So have you thought about, I'm sure you have because you're so intentional, what will you do with the trauma-informed therapy? Like, what are you thinking around that? You know, what I will say is that I'm not 100% sure. I knew that for me, though, it was important for me to understand trauma in its entirety, Mm. right? Because I think, especially in studying to be a marriage and family therapist, there's a lot of different avenues that you can travel down. And so, like, I definitely don't want to kind of lock myself into one thing. But the intention for me in making that decision was understanding how trauma had impacted me and making sure that I had the awareness and the tools to be able to work with my coaching clients um, around kind of issues of trauma and not in the capacity as a therapist, not in the capacity of a therapist, but just in general, general, right? Being yeah. able to recommend to them like mind, more mindfulness practices and being able to describe to them like what's happening in their bodies, in the bodies that have stored trauma, right? Like a lifetime of trauma and not just of yourself because intergenerational trauma is a real thing as well. Absolutely. 
yeah, so that that was really the intention behind it. I kind of feel like sky's the limit. I can I can do so much with being trauma informed. But yeah, there's there's that was kind of what my why for choosing to study that. It sounds like first and foremost though, it was for you. Yeah. Yeah, really? and, and I think that's why we do anything. Well, not all of us, but mm-hmm. many of us certainly that are in these helping kind of more healing professions. It starts mm-hmm. out just with this this need, and I think this is really an ADHD thing too. This need to <laughs> understand ourselves, right? Because yeah. we don't. Oh my god! We're so different. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, one hundred percent, and and that was the thing too. Like I, I was obsessed with like anything. Meyer Briggs, like that would tell me a little bit more about myself, natal charts. Like yeah. I was, I was in it. Like I, cause I just wanted to know more about me and get a better mm-hmm. understanding of this, who I was. Right. And what role that I served in this world. And I think I will say in doing the work on myself, it made me understand that my purpose is to serve other people. Yeah. That it is to really guide people, you know, in in getting clear on their own lives. And I can say that a lot of the work that I've done for myself has truly, truly, truly benefited a lot of people around me and not even just my clients, my coaching clients, but just the people that I talk to on a regular everyday basis. Yeah. And so it definitely started with me and yeah, it's not going to end with me for certain. (laughs) It's interesting though, when we understand ourselves better, it -hmm. allows us to understand other people better as well. Oh Oh my, yeah. The, I have learned so much about grace all right. I've learned so much about grace. And I think from what's been so powerful for me is kind of looking at myself, right? And, and going through therapy or going to therapy and being intentional about like my my practices that has allowed me to look at the people in my life and approach them from a place of non-judgment. Mm-hmm. And we've been able to have a lot more, I think, really healing conversations because I'm not looking at them like, Ugh, like, why are you this way? Why are you, you know, because again, I understand the idea of that social construction, right? And then a lot of who we are is relational, as I stated earlier. And so I've been able to just approach people in situations with a lot more grace And that has been huge, huge for me and my relationships. Like I have healthier relationships now as a result of that work. Well, I think you just become more compassionate, right? That you realize, I I don't know, you know, it's that puritanical work ethic, right? If, If you're not doing things a certain way, if you're not on time and if you're not doing well in school and, you know, it starts when we were little, it's all because it's a moral fa- failing. It's a character flaw. And you realize mm-hmm. that, no, it's just brain. And then what happened to you, right? The trauma component. Yeah. 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 And what's beautiful is right now, like I said, a lot of people have come to that realization and are willing to now take a look at their themselves and their lives the more through a more introspective lens. Mm. And so that's really great. And I think that's a despite all everything that is going on in the world, because I know it's easy things. It's kind of a dumpster fire right now, right? (laughs) If we're, (laughs) if we're being real. (laughs) And we're kind of leading that dumpster fire. Yeah. You know, no, no big deal. (laughs) It's kind of a dumpster fire. And, but despite that, we are in a very interesting space right now where people are like uh, having those aha moments. Yeah. And they're just, just, choosing to do things differently and choosing to live life in a way that actually works for them, that speaks to who they are on a 
personal or even soul level, right? And kind of this idea of coming back home to yourself. Yeah, I love it. So LaToya, what do you think the key to living successfully with ADHD is? This is probably going to sound so cliche, but to embrace it. Mm. I think that ADHD for me, especially being diagnosed formally, is the greatest thing that could have happened to me. It finally, as we spoke about earlier, this idea of like looking for or trying to understand yourself, I finally got to that place where I was like, okay, got it. I'm clear on this now. So who is LaToya with ADHD? And it's been a really beautiful exploration these last two years of of figuring that out. And so I always say that ADHD is really my superpower. It's allowed me and to do so many different things and opened up so many different doors and possibilities for me. Um, so embrace it, embrace it. And also it's helped me in regards to my support system. Cause I used to have a really hard time asking for help and asking for support. And I had to be really honest with myself one day and say like, you know, support is waiting for you if you ask for it. Right. Yeah. I had to get really clear on that. And it's support has shown up for me in regards to me just saying like, hey, so this is what's going on <laughs> with me. I, I, re- you know, I recently got diagnosed with ADHD. And so I'm, I'm just kind of a little bit of a learning curve here, right? Because I was essentially 30 years of just being undiagnosed, right? Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So that's, it's, it's improved my relationships with other people and my capacity to trust. Ah, and um, what are the ADHD traits that you feel are responsible for your success? <laughs> My impulsivity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Professional I, disruptor of culture. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, I think that has served me so, so well. I've been able, the things I've been able to do, the people that I've been uh, able to meet the skill sets that I've picked up just because like on a whim, I'm just like, all right, yeah, I'm gonna, I want to study improv. So I'm going to go do that. Like, I just, you know, like, or I'm going to join this uh, acting troupe. No big deal. So I think my impulsivity is probably the thing that has served me the, the absolute most. Love it. And do you have a ADHD workaround for us? Yes. So hmm, let me think, man, 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 man. It's my ADHD workaround. Well, let's go back to what I said earlier. Choosing support, Mm. choosing to ask for support, right? So that's definitely been huge for me and been so helpful for me. And also just kind of breaking down, and again, cliche, right? But breaking down (laughs) a lot of of my task and understanding that, for example, I come from a family where it's just like, if we're cleaning, we're cleaning every single thing in the house. Like it's all getting done today, one day, that's it. That's all we got. And <laughs> I've had to do a lot of like unlearning of that and giving myself the space and the grace to say like, you know what, this is what I'm just, this is what I'm going to focus on today. And I know that that can be difficult for people with ADHD, but the grace, just giving myself the grace and the understanding to uh, make things work for me, (laughs) regardless of how it looks for other people. Absolutely. I'm into that. So before I let you go, are you working on something you want to tell us about? Yes. Yes. So as I've mentioned, I am a life coach. Um, so yeah, please visit me. My website is yggcoaching.com. I would love to hear from some of you, all of you, I'm not picky. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and you can follow me on Instagram at your greatest good at 
Y-O-U-R-G-R-E-A-T-E-S-T-G-O-O-D. Okay. Your greatest good. So YGGcoaching.com. Instagram is at your greatest good. Mm-hmm. We will have all of that in the show notes, LaToya. Thank you so much for spending time with us here today. You are a delight and I feel privileged to have spoken with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I truly, truly appreciate it. This has been such a blast. Wonderful. So that's what I have for you for this week. Look, if you like this episode with LaToya, please let us know by leaving a review. Our goal is to change the conversation around ADHD, helping as many women as we possibly can learn how their ADHD brains work so that they too may discover their amazing strengths. As always, you're listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. Come join me over at tracyoutsuka.com. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you here next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Outsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, it's also the name of our free Facebook group. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. Join us at tracyoutsuka.com, where you can also find more information on our Your ADHD Brain is a OK system. I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.